book of Philemon. That's where we're going to be tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for praying. <coughs> Thank you for being awake. You're awake, right? All right. If you found it, say amen. Say amen. Everybody's there. Y'all know where it is. Okay. Tonight's message is about the power of persuasion. I want to talk to you about how the gospel persuades us. The Apostle Paul is writing a persuasive letter. Uh, there's an occasion around which he crafts the letter that we are reading tonight. There's a man by the name of Philemon. Paul led to the Lord. Philemon owned a slave whose name was Onesimus. Now that may cause you to bristle to think about that, but in the Roman Empire in the first century, possibly as many as half the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. They had conquered they had taken over lands, and they had brought in people and enslaved them. And because of poverty and other things, many people entered into slavery. Uh, if you were a slave in that day and time, you could have very well been upper middle class. It, doctors were slaves. It was, that was just the way that it was back then. The slave, his name was Onesimus. Onesimus decided to escape, to flee, to run away. He's going to go to Rome. He's going to hide out. He's going to get in a big city where nobody's going to find them. Apostle Paul found him. Paul leads Onesimus to Christ. And so now you have Philemon who owns a slave that has run away who's become a Christian. What's the right thing to do? Onesimus is the property of Philemon. Paul wants Onesimus to be set free, but he can't just take another man's property so he's going to write this letter he's going to send Onesimus back to the owner from which he escaped and it seems probably stole some things to help him along his way in his escape he's going to return Onesimus to his master and Paul is writing a persuasive letter hoping to encourage Philemon to set Onesimus free Every sentence, it seems to me, in this letter is pregnant with meaning. Uh, things that are there that would lend the thoughts of Philemon to see how he should act in a Christian way toward his new brother, Onesimus. And Paul's writing is encouraging to him to do the right thing but is also encouraging to us because the gospel is woven throughout everything and the gospel is ultimately what Paul is using to minister to Philemon to show him the right thing to do. So let's read the text together, become familiar with it, and I'll talk to you about the different things that we see throughout this text that would lead us to see the gospel in Paul's writings so that not only can we see how Philemon would be persuaded, but also how the gospel persuades us to live and act and think and make decisions differently. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you since I am of such a person as Paul the aged and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is both useful to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, 
that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but rather your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would, receive, would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The very first word in the book can really set the stage and lay a foundation for everything else. Paul introduces himself. Paul. But in our minds, knowing the story and the history, the Apostle Paul wasn't always Paul, was he? Paul used to be Saul. Paul used to be evil, wicked, godless. He was religious. He was moral. But he had turned his back on Christ, which means he had missed God. He had missed salvation. But God changed him. God made him into a new person. Saul became Paul. Saul was born again. God gave him a new name. The Bible says when we get saved, old things pass away and all things become new. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's who Paul was. That's who Onesimus was. That's who Philemon was. A new creature. A new creation. And with that idea in mind, the idea of things that are new, I'm going to give you several points as we go through this, every one of them having to do with the idea of something new that comes about because of the gospel. Paul was a new person, and just like Paul was new, Philemon was new as well, which means the old things that passed away shouldn't be the things that determined or directed Philemon's decision in his life. Now his direction and decision should be made based on the gospel, based on Christ, based on what God has made him into and called him to and wants him to do. And so... The big idea with Philemon is going to be, is he going to act like an old slave owner or is he going to act like someone who's been born again of the Spirit of God and is walking with Jesus and living his life, not for this life, but for the next. Paul had a new name. There was a new faith as well. He says, I am Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. When God saved Paul, Paul had to do what every Christian has to do. Jesus said, if any man is going to follow me, let him deny himself and take up a cross and come after me. Uh, there was a cross that Paul bore. He didn't know what that cross was going to entail, but for him, ultimately, following Jesus led him to be in prison. He lost his freedom, and very often he has suffered a lot of pain as well. You see, being a Christian is going to cost you. Paul's going to ask Philemon to bear a cost. He doesn't have to do it. Slaves his property. He's valuable. Onesimus could do work for him that could make him money. Would you set a man free that had done you harm? Would you set a man free that had been like this to you? But you see, the thing is, when you got a new name, God makes you a new person. You have a new faith. You walk differently. You begin to trust people, trust God in a way you never trusted before. Did you notice that Paul said, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul's locked up by the Romans. He's in a Roman jail. 
But he said, God's got me right where he wants me. I'm in jail because this is where Jesus, the sovereign Lord, has directed my life to go. I'm not here because of the Romans. This is God's plan for me. I'm a prisoner of Jesus. This is what it means to walk by faith. To see the things that come into your life as sovereignly directed and determined by God so that you're not bitter and angry about what takes place, but you understand that there is a God, He is in control, He does have a plan, and He's working His plan. And Paul says, I trust Him. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul's going to call Philemon to walk by faith and to trust God as well, even though it's costly. Paul begins to introduce, or or begins to speak to others as well. You see in verse 2, he speaks to Apipha, I think that's Philemon's wife. Archippus would be his son. And it says that Philemon has a church that was meeting in his house. I believe this is in the city of Colossae. But he says something about Archippus. He calls him a fellow soldier. One of the things about getting a new name and walking by faith now with a new faith is that when God saves you, that means you've entered the war. There's a war, a spiritual war that's raging And every one of us becomes soldiers the day God saves us. He calls Archippus our fellow soldier. So what happens when you get that new name and that new faith? You get a new calling on your life. It's time to go to war and to fight the good fight. Uh, You also not only get a new calling, but you get a new life. Uh, Look how Paul finishes his introduction in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Before there was a war between Philemon and God. Just like there was a war between Paul and God, or Saul and God, or there was a war between me and God. The Bible says I was at enmity with God. Uh, The wrath of God abided on me. Christ on the cross when he hung and suffered and died for our sins assumed that wrath and assumed that anger of God and Christ through His cross took care of this for me so that now my sin has been removed because it's separated from me from God and the anger of God against my sin has been satisfied in Jesus so that now the one that I was at war with I can now be at peace with. And there's peace that flows from the Father now. Grace to you and peace. There's grace as well. God had given Philemon something he didn't deserve. Salvation, full and free. That's what grace is. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Paul is going to stir Philemon's mind to remember the peace of God that had come upon him because when God gives you peace, you want to be at peace with your fellow brothers and sisters. You you want to be at peace with all those that are in Christ Jesus. But he's reminding them also of grace because just like God gave Philemon something he didn't deserve, Now the one that's received grace is going to be asked to do something for another that that person doesn't deserve. Would you show grace to another like God's shown grace to you? Philemon is already stirred with a new name and a new faith and a new calling and a new life that has come because of Jesus. And then there's a new relationship as well. We could mention this also because I noticed that as we look through these first few verses... You see things like our sister, our brother, or our father. You see, when you come into the the faith, you come into a family. And you, you now have brothers and sisters in a spiritual sense, but in a bond that is stronger even than blood because it lasts for eternity. And so Philemon is already, I'm sure, starting to understand that this Onesimus, who is a slave, is also family could you dare enslave your brother so he's got a new calling a new life a new relationship and now it's time to get to his new walk i thank god always making mention of you in my prayers because i hear of your love this is a a chiasmus if you don't know what that is it's a, a sometimes jewish people would start a sentence and end the sentence with the same thought and in the middle there'd be two things that come together so he's going to talk about the love that he has toward uh, the saints and the faith that he has toward Jesus. He brings faith up at the beginning and end and Jesus at the end and love and the saints in the middle. So that's 
what he's talking about here. I, or actually, I said that backwards. Love at, and the saints at the end and faith in Jesus in the middle. That's how it should have gone. So I hear your, of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. So he's now a man that's begun to walk by faith. And he started to live that new commandment that Jesus said that he gave. Uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, his community and his church, his family, church family, he shows them love and he showers them love and he lives for Jesus and he lives a life of faith before the world. And then Paul begins to talk about the, his reputation because he's, he's got this new reputation now that he's got a new walk. Paul says, I hear of your love and I hear of your faith. And that's what begins to happen is when you begin to walk with Jesus, people are watching. And they're not just watching, but they're also talking about you. And they could see a difference in your life. When you start to act differently than you used to act, and people know why. It's because Jesus has changed your life. He saved your soul. This new creation, this new creature that you've become is starting to manifest itself and others are taking notice. Paul says, I hear what's going on. How you're living this wonderful life for Jesus of love and of faith. And I think this is important because again, Paul is writing a persuasive letter. And here's what I found out. If you have somebody that you love or admire, you want them to think well of you. I'm sure Philemon looks up to Paul, admires him greatly. Philemon came to Christ through Paul. Philemon wants Paul to think well of him. Paul says, I hear about your reputation. You know what? A good name is more valuable than gold. If you've got a good name, do everything you can to keep it. He doesn't want to mess up his good name. He, he wants to do the right thing. Because doing the wrong thing would, would maybe, of course, in his mind, make had the idea that Paul would begin to see him in a different light, not walking by faith, not walking in love, not holding to the high standard of which he's been walking. And so with his new relationships he has and this new walk that he's begun, living out the new commandment of Jesus, he's begun to have a new reputation and it he, he begins to bear new fruit. Fruit for the kingdom of God. It says, I'm, it, Paul says, I'm praying that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Basically what Paul's saying here is this. I'm praying that you're going to do the right thing based on the knowledge you have about how to live by faith. God's done a work in you, but now you've got to begin to take what you know, and this knowledge is both intellectual and it's experiential. And you know that's how you become to gather knowledge as a Christian, is it? You, you gather information. Very often it comes from hearing or reading the, the, the Bible, pre, the preaching of the Word of God. You start to take this stuff in, but then you take what you have and you begin to live it out in your life. So God gives you this knowledge and you come to grow in that knowledge. And, and sometimes you get to a place where, all right, now there's a decision that has to be made. And so how can I take everything that God has put in my head and everything that I've experienced where I've begun walking with Jesus and seeing how God works and how, how God takes what His Word tells me to, to think and how He tells me to act, and I've begun to live it out, and I've seen how God is right, and I'm, I'm usually wrong uh, because I don't think the way God thinks, so I need to do what God wants me to do. How do I take all that and apply it to whatever situation I'm in? And Paul says, I'm praying that you get it. It's a good thing. Because when you do, you're going to be able to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And it's going to become effective. That's the word that he uses in verse 6. It's going to be energized. This knowledge and experience that he has is going to lead to something really, really good. But you've got to do the right thing to get there. So Paul says, I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints, they're being refreshed through you, brother. Again, his reputation, they, he's being a blessing to so many others. Therefore, Paul says in verse 8, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I appeal to you. What is Paul saying there? Paul is an apostle 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has authority given to him by Almighty God. Can the man of God who has apostolic authority walk into any church or any Christian's life and order them to do something and expect that they'll obey and listen to him? Absolutely. Paul says, I could do that. I could tell you what I want you to do and not give you a choice. Paul says, I don't want to do that. Now, why wouldn't he want to do that? Because there's an outcome that he wants. He's got the authority to make it happen. He doesn't do it because he loves Philemon. And for Philemon to grow and to be benefited, Philemon needs to do the right thing because he wants to. In other words, when you get saved, there ought to be new motivations that come into your heart. And the motivations should drive you. What we do should come internally and work itself out. It should start here. There shouldn't be an outside source forcing us, making us do something. It should be that not that I have to, not that I ought to, but that I want to and I get to. I mean, you've heard me talk about this with giving. Uh, I don't stand up here and say, you have to give. What I tell you? You get to give. You ought to want to give. But nobody's going to make you. Now it's good for you. It's better for you. But you, your heart needs to be in it. I want you to serve. But I'm not going to make you serve. I want you to do it because you want to do it. Because when you do it out of love, it's profitable. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter in the Bible, where Paul is talking about love, and he says things like this, if I speak with the tongue of angels, I'm just, but I have not love, I'm just like a, a, a brass symbol. In other words, if I don't speak with love, my words, they don't mean anything. I could give my body to be burned, but if I have not love, it profits me nothing. You know that you could do all sorts of sacrificial and wonderful things, but if you don't have a heart of love when you do it, there's no profit in it. Your words become nothing. Your, your actions profit you nothing, and you become nothing. There needs to be love that motivates you. There's a new motivation there. Paul says, I could do this and make you do it, but I don't want that for you. I want you to do the right thing because you want to do it, not because you have to. So I appeal to you for love's sake, he says. Love for Jesus, love for Paul, love for Onesimus. Verse 9, he says, I, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you since I am such a person as Paul the aged. I thought that was an interesting thing for Paul to throw in there. <laughs> I'm old. That's what Paul's saying here. I, I, I've got a lot of years on me. I'm Paul the aged. Now remember, what is he trying to do? He's trying to persuade somebody here. Why do you think he throws that aged thing in there? I'm such a one as Paul the aged, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now the idea of the prisoner thing ought to just rattle our brains, shouldn't it? If Paul is willing to give up his body and his freedom and his life and go to jail for the cause of Christ, certainly Philemon could do a lot. You know, what Paul's asking Philemon is not nearly what Paul's willing to do for Jesus. So th that should be something that would drive them right there. But I think this idea of Paul the age, I'll give you two thoughts that I had with that. One is this. When I was growing up, my parents taught me this. They said, if an adult ever tells you to do anything, I'm talking about when I was a little boy. I'm talking about real little. If an adult ever speaks to you and tells you to do anything, you better do it. And if I didn't do it for me to disobey that adult, I was disobeying mom and daddy. So if an adult said to me, stop running, I'll stop running. If an adult said, in fact, my grandmother especially taught me this. When you hear any adult speak and ask you anything, you say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You say, yes, sir, no, sir. In other words, there was a respect for your elders that was taught. Now, I don't think it's being taught in this day and time, but when you hear Paul say, I am Paul the age, I, I think in past times there was 
this idea that if there's someone like that, you ought to respect them if for no other reason God's kept them here long enough. They've got a lot of age and wisdom, and you need to honor that. But I'll give you another thought that goes along with it. Um, I think it's no secret, the older you get, the closer you are to going home, right? Now, we don't know when we're going home, but when you've got someone that is elderly, their time might not be long. It might just be short. If you've got somebody you love, there ought to be the thought in the back of your mind, you know, they're not going to be here forever. If I've got an opportunity to show them how much they mean to me by doing something that would honor them or a way to, to show obedience to them, that the, if they ask me to do something, I'll do it. Because I, I don't know how many more chances I'll have to do that for them. I'm Paul the age. Maybe there's a little hint of maybe one or both of those things in what he said, but again, Paul's being persuasive, and Paul's talking about the motivations here, and uh, Paul's using every bullet in his gun when he's firing bullets here. New motivation. Let, let me move on real quick. Verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my imprisonment. Now, when Paul starts talking in these lines another thought about something new that I'll give you Paul shows us a new example to follow Paul's in prison what is he doing he's winning people to Jesus isn't he? anybody and everybody's telling him about Jesus how in the world are you going to win somebody to Jesus and you're locked up he found a way Paul had friends they'd go out they'd find people bring them to prison hey you need to come here this guy Paul Paul telling about Jesus. Guards are there. He's telling people about Jesus. He's, he's living the Christian life. The walls aren't imprisoning him. It, it, the, the gospel's not chained. It's still going forth. And so when Paul says, uh, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, Paul won Onesimus to Jesus. Now, now listen, when Onesimus becomes a believer in Jesus, he becomes Paul's brother in Christ. He becomes Philemon's brother in Christ. But did you notice Paul didn't say, I appeal to you for my brother, Onesimus. What did he say? I appeal to you for my child. You lead somebody to Jesus. God is their father. But God has used you to bring that child into the faith. They, they, they become like yours. They're special to you. He's not just a brother. He's like my child, my son, or my daughter would be. If you lead somebody to Jesus, they, they, there's something about that where you've got that role to play. And the Holy Spirit of God inspires Paul to say it this way. This is my child. And again, Paul being persuasive. If you love Paul, how would you treat Paul's child? He came to you. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. See, one of the things about being saved is you get a new life in Christ, and God takes people that before were useless, and He makes them useful. Onesimus, what was he worth when he was lost? He wasn't worth nothing. He was a runaway slave. He wasn't useful for anything. Jesus has saved him. Paul's discipled him. What's happened now? The one that wasn't worth a dime, very valuable, very useful for the kingdom of God now. God's got a plan for this man's life. God's got a purpose. God's going to do something with him. His life's not being thrown away anymore. It's being lived for Jesus, which means it is of infinite value. It's what God does for those he saves. I know something about that. My life before I was saved, I wasn't worth anything. Then God's saved. God will take a nobody and make him a somebody. He was formerly useless to you, but now he's useful for both you and me. I've sent him back to you in person. That is, I'm sending my own heart. Paul's saying, I love him as much as I love 
myself. Once again, that new commandment. And look what else Paul says here in verse 13. Whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. Now here's a new way of making a difference. Don't miss this. Paul says, Philemon, you can't be here to minister to me as I'm locked up in prison in Rome. Onesimus can. By you making it so that Onesimus ministers to me, he becomes your representative and you're serving Jesus by serving me through him. So think about how you give to missionaries and missionaries go around the world and they take the gospel and they share uh, Jesus with people that, that don't know him. You can't be in China because you're here, but you're sending somebody else and they're ministering over there. They're your representatives, but they're there because you sent them. So there's a way that we can serve sometimes not by going, but by enabling somebody else who can go to do the work. So there's a new way of making a difference here. Verse 14. But without your consent, he says, I don't want to do anything so that by your goodness, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but by your own free will. Again, giving without love is not profitable. Paul doesn't want that. But per, for perhaps, verse 15, he was for this reason separated from you for a while so that you would have him back forever so Paul calls Philemon to th start thinking in a new perspective now the new perspective says that there's a providential hand of God a sovereign God who is working these things out I mean what are the odds of Paul meaning Philemon leading him to Christ and then finding who knows how many hundreds of miles away his runaway slave and then reconnecting these two Paul says I see God's hand in this but receive him back no longer as a slave, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. How much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? I feel like I've got a 100-point sermon here, and your minds are foggy now, so I'm going to try to go fast and uh, get through it. But here, pay, pay attention. It's some really good stuff as we close. If you then regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. Here's another new, a new position. Paul says, I'm sending Onesimus to you. Philemon, when he gets there, I want you to receive Onesimus like you would me. Let me ask you, if Paul walked through the door, how do you think Philemon would treat Onesimus? I mean, treat, treat Paul. Treat him like a king. Do everything he could for him. Treat Onesimus like you treat me. Listen. Is that not what Jesus has done for us? Father, they're mine. I've been washed in the blood. Christ has come to live in your heart. When you get to heaven, you're treated as a son, as a daughter. You, you get the treatment that God gives his child. Treat them like you would me. See, that's the gospel being worked out. It's the gospel on display. What Paul says about Onesimus is what Christ says for us. He's got a new position. By the way, it doesn't just stop there. Look at verse 18. If he has wronged you in any way, because again, what I say, when he ran away, it seems like from this verse he might have stolen something, maybe tore some stuff up before he left, but... He would have been working. He's not been working. All that's, you know, against him. And he's a runaway slave. So what is it? He's bankrupt. He, he doesn't have anything. What does Paul say? If he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Now, isn't that what Christ also does? Spiritually bankrupt. You can't offer God anything. What, what have you got that you're going to give to God? What does Jesus show up and do? Death. I'll pay what they owe. Every last cent. Our sin is a debt to God. And the Son of God says, whatever they owe, put it on my account. It's what the cross was about. It's what Calvary was about. Our debt is paid. The wages of sin is death. Christ dies to pay what we owe. And everything is paid in full. If he's wronged you, put it on my account. Regard him as you would me now. I, Paul says, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention 
that you owe me even your own self as well. Philemon owed Paul a debt just like Onesimus owed Philemon a debt. You know what's interesting about that? I've thought about this. There's a verse in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Proverbs. It says uh, this. He that lendeth to the poor lendeth to the Lord, and he will repay. You remember when Jesus said, Whatsoever you do to the least of these, that, that you do unto me. Now, here, here's what's interesting. We owe Jesus everything. And so, to lend unto the poor, should God have to pay us back for that? He doesn't. We owe Him everything, but yet He says, I'll repay anything. Paul says, you owe me everything, Philemon, but I'll still pay you back. Just a thought. You sit on that and dwell on that for a little while. Ah, Paul says, I'm, I'm writing this with my own hand. I'm going to repay it, not to mention that you owe me everything and your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you'll do even more than what I say. Here's a new standard that he gives. Same standard Jesus gave. Do you remember when Jesus said, if any man makes you go a mile with him, go two? John Maxwell says something like this, that's the extra mile. He said, always take the extra mile. He said, traffic, there's no traffic on the extra mile. You know, that's, that's what happens when you get saved and you start listening to Jesus. You, you'll go to extra mile. You, you'll do over and above what somebody asks. That, that becomes the new standard for us. How, how, how much farther can I go than I have to? Not because, I'm not doing it because I have to. Now I'm doing it because I want to do, and I'm going to go even above and beyond. That's what Paul says about Philemon. Philemon, I know you're going to do good, and you're going to do better than even what I'm asking. Verse 22, that now there's a, also a new incentive. Look what it says here. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging. For I hope that through your prayers I'll be given to you. You say, why is that a new incentive, preacher? I'll tell you why. Paul says, I want you to pray for me that I get out. If I get out, I'm going to come see you. I think with me. Paul's asking Philemon to do something. How would you like to have to look Paul in the eye if you don't do what he asked you to do? One day there's a knock at your door. There's Paul there. I asked you to do something. Now I'm here to see you. You know if Paul's coming, he's going to want to do this, right? Now let me make another leap. Jesus is coming. One day, you're going to look him in the eye. It'll be flames of fire. He's asked us to live a certain way. He's called us to a mission. He, he, he's elevated us to a higher standard. Called us to serve. Called us to take the gospel. Called us to go forth. You're going to look him in the eye one day. If you know that day is coming, don't you want to be ready for when it happens? See, there starts to be a new motivation when you start to think about having to face somebody face to face. It's one thing not to do it and know that I'm never going to have to answer to anybody for it. It's another thing to know, yeah, one day we're going to meet. And I'll just give you one more thing here and then we're done. He, he, he closes it out with Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you. Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, who ended up not being so great a guy. Luke, my fellow worker. There's new witnesses. Remember I told you before, somebody's always watching. God's called him to do a big thing and to give in a big way, to serve in a big way. But now there's other people involved and they know about what could possibly happen. How should he live knowing that there are witnesses that are going to be privy to whatever his decision is? See, our decisions affect other people. Very often when we walk by faith and act in love, it elevates other people to act the same way we are, to, to live like we're, we've lived and, and to do the right thing. And, and when we don't live the right way, when we become argumentative or bitter or disunifying or, or, or just nasty or disobedient or we don't love or we don't 
walk by faith, but we walk by sight. When we live that way, isn't that going to hurt the walk or hinder the walk of others sometimes? They can. And it'll discourage them. And instead of giving them cause to joy and celebrate, it'll cause them just to hang their head. There's new witnesses there. People know and they're watching. The gospel motivates us. New creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. All things became new. Don't know how it ended, but there's speculation. And here's what we think happened. Maybe. Think Philemon gave Onesimus his freedom. think maybe handed him the letter that Paul wrote. And they think Onesimus became a pastor and kept the letter and preserved it, passed it around, and now it's in the book. Thank God for people that give. Thank God for people that serve. Thank God for the new life in Christ Jesus. Let's pray, church. Father, thank you for the freedom that you give us when you set us free. Lord, we were slaves to sin. We were in bondage. We were captive. And the blood that was shed on Calvary broke those bonds and gave us a new life that we could have never known apart from Jesus. God, I'm so thankful for what you did for us. God, I pray that you help us to take what we've heard tonight, to learn from it, to live it, to be obedient, to be people of faith, people of love people that have the knowledge, both intellectually and experientially, that we put into practice so that we make the right decisions when they come our way. God, what a terrible thing if Philemon would have gone the other way with this. Just balled the letter up, thrown it to trash, and not done the right thing. It would have been such a shame one day when Paul showed up, but it would have been worse when he stood before you. God, give us wisdom to make the right decisions, to know how to walk by faith so that when that day comes, there's joy. Lord, let us live for that day. In your name we ask it. Amen. Bless you, church. Have a good night.